He said that was his favorite moment in church when the preacher would say, you can be seated. I've never forgotten. Every time I say it, I reminded of my, my friend Luke DeMann. Uh, greetings, Trinity, Myrtle Beach. I have to say that um, in God's economy and God's sense of humor, something marvelous and magical happened last night at our church. We worship at 5 p.m. on Saturday nights. My name is Gary Beeson. My wife, Susan, is here with me today. The three kids didn't want to make the trip. Anyway, uh, we worship at 5, and last night after a lot of wrangling, we were able to get Rob Sturdy to come to our church. Right. So I know a lot of you are thinking, well, why couldn't Rob have just come up here this morning? He, uh, he's getting ready for the cadets to come back at the Citadel, and we had heard him speak, a group of us, and we were excited about having him. So Rob wanted me to say, if I didn't say anything this morning, that he sends his love to this church, and he loves you as his family. Those were the words that he used. And he'll be praying for you in this interim time. So Rob Sturdy uh, sends his blessings. I want to talk this morning briefly about doorways, doors, and gates. Doorways, doors, and gates. Did anybody's blood pressure rise just a little bit when you heard the words of the gospel? Jesus, with a crowd of people following him, in Luke, it's beginning to form a, a, a pattern. He goes and heals, more people come, and he leaves that town and he goes and feeds, more people come, and so now he's surrounded by a lot of people and he's making his way toward Jerusalem. That was a great sermon I heard a few weeks ago. Because Jesus goes to Jerusalem, we can come to Jesus. Well, anyway, he's making his way to Jerusalem. And with this large crowd around him, he pauses and he turns and looks at his close, his inner circle of friends, and he says those haunting words. Did you hear them? It ought to make some of us nervous this morning, sitting here in church, scrubbed and shaved and brushed teeth and clean. Did you hear them? There's a narrow, narrow gate. Getting into heaven, it sounds like it's going to take some thin behavior. You're going to have to, getting into heaven is not going to be easy. And then he goes on to tell a second story because there are actually two stories. We get that wrong sometimes. When we think it's just about a gate and it suddenly becomes a door, no. He says there is a narrow gate with which you can get in to the kingdom of God. Remember this if you don't remember anything about what I say. Doors, gates have two properties. Amen? Very good. It took me a few of those at the eight o'clock service to get them going. But I told them the more they amend me, the faster I'd go and the quicker we'd be finished. And so they began to really, amen. All right. Doors and gates have two properties. They're either opened or they're closed. That's what sets our hearts aflutter, doesn't it? Because Jesus says, the door was closed. And the householder was preparing to go to bed. It's right here in our Gospel of Luke that Suzanne read so beautifully this morning. And we get the scene. The lights are being turned off. But there's a few people, maybe those that came to Trinity on Sunday morning at 8 or 9.30 or 11, who are outside the locked door. It's one of the states of doors. Remember, it's closed. And they're out there, and they sound like they know the householder, don't they? Hey, wait a minute. We were at worship. Our kids were in youth group. I've clicked on the overheads. I played in the praise band. I know you, householder. And then he says those words, I don't know you. Depart from me. <clears throat> Depart from me, you workers of iniquity or evil. King James really nails it. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We've got to get to that place this morning to hear the good news. Imagine Jesus comes through the door. He looks amazing. I have a vivid imagination. I do this all the time. It makes some people uncomfortable. But he's six feet tall. He's got a great tan, blue eyes, and dark hair. I know it. And he comes through that door, and he smiles at all of us, and he says those words. I tell you, I do not know where you come from. And we think, no, I was on the vestry. I was on the altar guild. You know me. I thought I was really near you when I was up here. Wasn't I closer to you than the rest of them? You know me. I don't know you, he says. Depart from me, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So doors are open or they're closed. And I want us to look at the gospel in light of the Hebrews passage, which is so big and broad and lovely. The, the story in there of the two bloods. Did you catch that? The story of the blood of the first murder in the Bible? What does that voice sound like? Well, that voice, Rob told us last night, cries out for justice. And the blood in the second part of the Hebrews passage is the blood of Christ. That is the voice of justice. 
So we could stay in Hebrews all day, but I want to talk about this locked door, this closed door, just for a second. And I want us to think about the psalm that we heard beautifully read, Psalm 46, verse 10. And it's one most of your grandparents have memorized. People have on the walls of their houses sometimes. Be still and know that I am... Hard to do, isn't it? It's hard for us, compulsive, type A, get things done kind of people, to be still and know that I am... The door's shut. We're inside. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Juxtaposed against that are Jesus' words of instruction. And this is where we begin to go wrong. We forget, be still and know that I am God. And we hear Jesus say this. Strive. Strive, therefore, to enter through the narrow door. For I tell you, many will seek to enter and not be able to. Strive, strive, strive. We hear that and we think, am I doing enough? My associate worked as a chaplain in a hospital last summer, and he tells a very haunting story about going to visit people who were in hospice. And anytime he went to a door of someone and they had on the door that they were a worshiping Christian of any faith, Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, Evangelical, he said the number one thing that those people lying on their deathbeds would ask him is, do you think I'm going to heaven? People sitting here this morning have that same thought in their heads. Some of us are thinking, I wonder if I'm going to heaven. I wonder if I've strived enough. I wonder if I've strived enough. I wanna leave you right there because this parable is not entirely about judgment. It's more about past life, future life. It's a great deal more about who we used to be and who God has plans for us to be now and for eternity. And it's a great deal more about this. How do we get in? It's not so much about who's in and who's out because they bandy around these words in the gospel. Many are in, few are out. People will come from the east and the west. We don't, there's no, who knows how many? Only God knows in his infinite wisdom and mercy. But I know this. The boundaries, the definition of God's mercy have yet to be established. The boundaries of God's mercy have yet to be established. So who, how many shouldn't be bothering us this morning? What should be bothering us is how then do we get in? How, how, how? And what I believe Jesus, if he could walk through those doors and tell us, is it's pretty simple. He'd say something like, it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter how many times you came to church, which is, this is not a sermon about not coming to church. Um, It doesn't matter about what committees you were on. It doesn't matter about how many of the creeds you have memorized. It doesn't even matter about your good deeds. Although they are a reflection on God, every kind thing we do gives glory to God. Even people who don't believe in God are still glorifying God when they're kind. That's why we read those words at the beginning of the service to remind us that what we do glorifies God. So Jesus would say, even those good deeds don't help you get in. This parable is a great deal more about who we know than what we know. And it's also a great deal more about trading our old life in for our new life. What we need to know and what we should know about this gospel is that closed doors and opened doors are nothing for our Lord and Savior. Jesus doesn't care if the door's closed or open. How do we know? Scripture tells us he's walked through many of them, hasn't he? Remember the disciples? They're in the upper room two times after his crucifixion. The second one is my favorite. I don't have time to tell it, but it's about the Thomas moment. We all need a Thomas moment in our life. We all need that moment where we're confronted by ourselves face to face with the risen Lord. I pray each one of you has had that or will have that. That moment where your knees get weak and the sweat builds and the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you say those words, my Lord and my God, and you fall on your knees because that's the only response to that beautiful Lord of creation. Surrendering to God at the end of our theological ropes. Many of us have been there. Divorce will get you there. Divorce will get you to the end of that rope. Death of someone you love deeply will get you to the end of that rope. 
anger, unresolved anger, broken relationships, all of those things will take you to the end of that rope, which is exactly where you need to be in order to get in through the narrow door. And here's why. How many of us have been on airplanes? We get there early, seated, there's a traveler back there, and we're in our seat. And we look up the aisle, and here comes a guy with three backpacks, an underwater camera, and a child seat. And we say to ourselves, being logical Anglicans, there's no way that stuff's going to fit down the aisle, is there? And the flight attendants try to help, and the captain has to come out sometimes. And what they do is slowly but surely take everything away from this guy, except maybe his car seat. And then he kind of ambles down, shamed down the aisle, and finds his seat. Jesus is saying, if you want to enter the narrow gate, you have got to let go of those things. You've got to let go of your backpacks of anger. You've got to let go of those things that you're carrying, the brokenness that's been done to you and the brokenness you've done to others. You've got to drop that in order to get through this narrow gate. Well then, Gary, what do we bring? How do we get in? What's the key? Well, the key, of course, is the cross. The key that gets us through the door is what Jesus has done. And when we walk toward the door, which Jesus actually says that another place in the Bible is actually himself. When we approach the door and we understand the key, meaning we realize that he died in our place. We realize he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That he laid down his life for some of us before we even knew we needed it. And he climbed up on the cross, humiliated and naked, and he died in our place. When we know that, the door is always open. Two states of the door open or closed. And what we do is we stand there in one particular way, as we'll do this morning when we come up for communion. We're going to stand there in humility and in poverty. That's what we bring to the door. We bring a posture of defeat and open-handedness. I've tried as hard as I can. I've strived as long as I can. I have done my very best, Jesus, and it's gotten me to a place of frustration and brokenness. I don't know what to do. And he says, thank God. And when he sees us, folks, the only thing he's going to say to us, and I love this, it's not my idea, I stole it. The only thing he's going to say to us when we see Jesus, when we pass from this life to the next, the only thing he's going to say to us is our name. Now watch. Suzanne. David. Joe, he's he's just going to say our name. And we're going to go, Jesus? And he's going to go, yeah, yeah. And he's going to say our name again. And it's going to grip us in that place where he knows us because he knows we know him. That's the admission price through the narrow door. Let me leave you with this. One last thought about doors. I said earlier that doors are no obstacle to Jesus. And this is my favorite part about Jesus and doors. The biggest, baddest door in all of scripture is the gigantic boulder that was rolled in front of the tomb the day Jesus died. Amen? A little louder, I'll be done in two minutes. All right. The gigantic boulder that's rolled in front of the tomb. The next morning, three ladies, nothing against women, but on their best days, probably couldn't do more like all of us than just kick at the boulder. The boulder weighed, they estimate, a ton and a half. Three ladies go to a tomb that has been sealed with a boulder with two guards, big brawny dudes, guarding it. What in the world did they think they were going to do? They can't walk through the tomb, can they? They can't push the boulder back. They certainly couldn't overpower the guards, could they? These three women in faith who knew the key to the door. The one who had been killed and sacrificed the day before was behind that door. But guess what? He wasn't. He rolled it away. There's no door in our heart. There's no place in our life where Jesus won't come and open it if we ask him. Today, when we come up for communion, be reminded that as your hands are out like this to receive God, that you're coming in poverty. And be reminded about the third piece of your mission statement about being ambassadors. And this is where I'll close. It's Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, and that's what I said this parable was about. The old life is gone dead and the new life has come and this is all from God and he gives us then a ministry of reconciliation which simply means our job when we leave is to go and forgive every last person we can think of 
to go and forgive every last person we can think of. Therefore, he says at the end, we're ambassadors. And I love that term, and I'm glad it's in your, in your publication. Because it's a lot easier to be an ambassador than it is to be a disciple. In order to be a disciple, you gotta come to Trinity 13 weeks and take a class, right? Yeah, you gotta take, you gotta read a book. You gotta do some homework. You gotta do all kinds of things to become a disciple. The Holy Spirit actually makes disciples. But to be ambassador, there's only one requirement. If, if the President of the United States or the King of a country or a Queen called up a person and said, I want you to be my ambassador to Poland, it only takes one thing. And that is that you are friends with and know the King or the President. That's the only requirement. Amen. So if you know the key, if you know the way through the narrow door, we are therefore ambassadors called to go out into the world and share the love of Jesus. Share the love of Christ. Amen. So let's, um, let's remember that this morning. Let's remember that as we receive communion in our poverty. Um, let's remember that as we say the words of the creed, as we do the things that we do. Let's remember that the key to opening those closed doors in our hearts um, and in our lives is knowing who the key is and not what the key is. Amen.